Hello again there folks, so somebody sent me a, an essay recently by Vaclav Havel who was a, a dissident in the Soviet Union or in Eastern Europe behind the, the Iron Curtain during the communist times and he, he ended up becoming the last president of Czechoslovakia and he also wrote like a seminal extended essay uh, called The Power of the Powerless and the, somebody sent me and he said, you have to check out what he says about the greengrocer here and how it sort of applies to the West today. Uh, so I've gone through it and I actually uh, really do think it's fascinating. I hadn't heard of this before. Um, and the, the bits on the greengrocer are, are, are very interesting. So really, the, the background to this is that uh, it's written in 1978. And by that time, the communist system kind of, it, it kind of softened a bit, or at least it be. The communism tends to go through different stages. It has its first uh, stages where it's a complete bloodbath and a horror show, and then it, it kind of it kind of settles into a certain mode. And in this particular case, in in Czechoslovakia, it became much more sophisticated and clever at how it actually implemented itself. It wasn't so much about dragging thousands and thousands of people off to be shot, tanks rolling down the streets anymore. It had become um, more subtle and clever and complicated and how it actually imposed itself. And, I mean, I'm not doing some sort of boomer take here where it's like, oh, the West's being overtaken by uh, communists. And that's that's fair enough because Havel isn't actually that interested in the ideology either. <laughs> It's really about power and how power manipulates people and how power makes people conform. And the the story of the greengrocer is is very interesting. And it features a, a hypothetical uh, greengrocer who puts the slogan, like a sign, workers of the world unite in, his, in the window of his shop. And Havel questions what made him do that and what he gets from that and the effect that this has on the general society now in in like the west today you know we see these slogans and this messaging all over the place we've got political correctness we've got rainbow flags we've got black lives matter and it's like wall to wall everywhere you look all in the media all in the even um in, in, i was in newcastle recently i went down to the train station and it was like i was i saw this messaging all over the place and so, um, the, in what Havel's done with the case of the greengrocer is explore this, but from as you'd explore a system of power and how it makes people conform, and what there's quite a lot of interesting ideas in in here. So I've I've taken some extracts, and so he says, why in in fact did our greengrocer have to put his loyalty on display in the shop window? He had not already displayed it sufficiently in various internal or, or semi-public ways at trade me union meetings after all he had always voted as he should he had always taken part in various competitions he voted in elections like a good citizen he even signed the anti-charter why on top of all of that should he have to declare his loyalty publicly after all, the people who walk past his window will certainly not stop to read that. In the greengrocer's opinion, the workers of the world uh, ought to unite. The fact of the matter is, they don't read the slogan at all, and it can be fairly assumed that they don't even see it. If you were to ask a woman who had stopped in front of his shop what she saw in the window, you could certainly tell whether or not they had tomatoes today. <clears throat> But it is unli highly unlikely that she noticed the slogan at all, let alone what it said. It seems senseless to require the greengrocer to declare his loyalty publicly, but it makes sense nevertheless. People ignore his slogan, but they do so because such slogans are also found in other shop windows, on lampposts, bulletin boards, in apartment windows and on buildings. They are everywhere, in fact. They form part of the panorama of everyday life, of course, while they ignore the details. People are very aware of that panorama as a whole. What else is the greengrocer's slogan but a small component in the huge backdrop to daily life? The greengrocer had to put the slogan in his window, therefore, not in the hope that someone might read it or be persuaded by it, 
but to contribute along with thousands of other slogans to the panorama that everyone is very much aware of. This panorama, of course, has a subliminal meaning as well. It reminds people where they are living and what is expected of them. And so the greengrocer has made a decision here. Um, basically, it's a virtue signal. It's This is the communist version of a virtue signal. He wasn't forced to do it. But what he knows is which side his bread is buttered on. And he knows that if he puts in his window, workers of the world unite, even if he doesn't believe in it, even if he finds it ridiculous, it's a way to signal to the power structure that I'm okay. I'm not a threat. Don't worry about me. Um, I'm conforming. And what I find fascinating about this is that he's conforming as an individual. He's an individual with agency, which is, of course, blows all of this stuff out the water that you hear about what we need is more individualism. Well, the fact is the individual will always bend the knee to the power structure because it will make the power structure get off his back. All really the, the individual wants to have happen is to be left alone. And so the path to individualism really is, is conformity. You can find your individuality if you bend the knee. If you conform, then after the fact, you're in the clear and they leave you alone. So then he goes on and he says, We have seen that the real meaning of the greengrocer's slogan has nothing to do with what the text of the slogan actually says. Even so, this real meaning is quite clear and generally comprehensible because the code is so familiar. The greengrocer declares his loyalty and he can do no other if his declaration is to be accepted in the only way the regime is capable of hearing. That is, by accepting the prescribed ritual, by accepting appearances as reality, by accepting the given rules of the game. In doing so, however, he has himself become a player in the game thus making it possible for the game to go on, for it to exist in the first place. So now, um, he has actually gone from a neutral stance. He's decided that he's going to virtue signal, he's going to put the communist slogan in his window, and the effect that that has is that he is now reaffirming and spreading the message of the power structure. So it isn't actually so much about the ideology, it's about power. He is actually reaffirming the power that he lives under, even though he's doing it to conform as an individual. And so the, somebody will come into the shop who maybe doesn't care too much for that slogan either, and they are then confronted with it as well. They are then in the presence of the power structure. So just think about that today. Just think about all of these rainbow flags we see absolutely plastered everywhere in, in the Western world today. It's, it's, it's the exact same thing. And, and I think the takeaway, one of the takeaways from this uh, essay is that we have to kind of look past the the ideology of, of wokeness and what they actually have to say, and we have to view it instead just as power. This is just a power. This is just a flex, as people say. At the individual level, people conform, uh, he says, thinking only of themselves. Yet the overall effect on, on society is devastating because then the individual, through their own volition, is actually compounding the problem because they are... By, by conforming to it, they are then spreading its message still further. It's all about power. So then, um, he says, under totalitarianism, however, these correctives disappear, and thus there is nothing to prevent ideology from becoming more and more and more removed from reality, gradually turning in to what it has already become in the post-totalitarian system, a world of appearances, a mere ritual, a formalised uh, language deprived of semantic contact with reality and transformed into a system of ritual signs that replace reality with a pseudo-reality. Again, what it is is power, just raw power. Let us imagine that one day something in our greengrocer snaps and he stops putting up the slogans merely to ingratiate himself. He stops voting in elections he knows are a farce. He begins to say what he really thinks are political meanings. In other words, he's, he's going he's gonna to start and run against it. 
and he even finds the strength in himself to express solidarity with those whom his conscience commands him to support. In this revolt, the greengrocer steps out of living within the lie. So, what this does as well, so uh, on top of the power, it's also the lie that gets reaffirmed, and everybody gets dragged into the lie. So again, if we look around at the political correctness and all of these slogans and terminology t t today, first of all, you get the... Uh, superficially it's it's like the talking points and the the politics of the ideology itself but then you can peel the, this peel off the scab and you'll see that it is like just about a power flex and it is just a way of controlling people's behavior so a lot of people may roll their eyes at it uh, but they'll go along with it anyway because it just gets people off their backs and that's at this point i'm reminded of the uh, landlord in um down south the, the the colston pub so we had uh, the black lives matter riots in, uh, in bristol and they pulled down the statue of edward colston and then nearby there was this uh pub decided well they were called the colston arms and so all of a sudden it's as if he's a rabbit caught in the headlights because you've got a landlord of a pub who is now diametry in in the opposite direction to the power structure but it isn't the power structure it's just black lives matter and but he so then he's thinking well what do i do here my pub is a celebration of this this figure who they've just pulled a statue down he's he's he did slavery uh this is going to get me into trouble and what he did was pull the name down um and re rename it stupid something stupid so that he, he, in other words, he conformed, he virtue signaled before the mob, but the mob is itself part of the power structure. And this is actually, um, and, you know, so it, it reinforced it. The agenda moved forward because he wanted to conform. And once again, he's just an individual. He can't really blame him because what else is the individual supposed to do he can maybe get burned out or he may get fired from somebody else higher in the chain of the pub network so at the end of the day the individual is so weak he's always just going to conform because he just wants to be left alone but then just like the greengrocer the coolston arms pub uh, landlord reinforces the narrative he reinforces the power structure and it is a power structure because if it wasn't then he would never have to change the name of the pub in the first place because there'd be nothing to uh, be scared of. But in in our situation in the West, it's yet more sophisticated than the situation in Czechoslovakia again, because the it's it's a, essentially a negation of the power structure because all of these the woke LGBT agenda and all of that. It's been reframed so that they themselves think they are fighting against the power structure. Ridiculously so. So you see all of these huge multinationals and all of these politicians, all of the media comes out on their side. And if you take something, uh, the LGBT agenda, minority rights, uh, mass immigration, all of these things are actually, they've been reframed so that the this is the rebellion against the power structure. When of course... It isn't. It is the power structure itself. So at least in the Soviet Union, at least in the Czech Republic, uh, Czechoslovakia, let's say, then you, you had the, let's say, the Soviet system, the communism and the Communist Party, the central power structure. And then it was a choice of whether or not you were going to sign up to that or you were going to be in opposition to it, which would be really dangerous. In the West, uh, under like this neoliberal system, it's different because the dissident has been outsourced. The dissident is has become uh, the counterculture. Let's say is actually hegemonic, but it won't admit that it is. It's completely dominant, but it pretends we've got to go along with this farce 
that they are actually acting against the power elite when it isn't. It's just another arm of the power elite. Like that meme of the little Chinese boy with a welly stamping on his head with a welly. But it's you see it's just his arm. He's pretending to be oppressed and he isn't. So this means any kind of genuine... The first thing this does is offset dissidents so that the, the natural route that they'll take will be into uh, politically correct left-wing politics, which just feeds directly back into... It's really just doing the bidding of the system, and it's framed as being a dissident. And to be a genuine dissident, where, let's say if you're on the far right or whatever, uh, you're polit explicitly politically incorrect, then you're just a complete pariah and a moral outcast, and there's no place for you whatsoever. That's when the censorship and the hate speech laws come down, and all of that kind of thing, but it's delegitimized on a moral way. If we imagine a situation in England today, and why not, uh, whether or not it's the Coolest Norms pub or a greengrocer, you can see that it, the greengrocer, let's say, puts the, the rainbow flag uh, in his window, which they've been doing kind of with the NHS recently during the COVID crisis. Well, let's just sort of stick with that symbol. The symbol of uh, the agenda itself is this rainbow flag. Unlike the, the green grocer in the Soviet Union, then, he has he, there's a slight twist to it because he's saying, I'm in support of these vulnerable people, of these vulnerable groups and these, these minorities um, against the power structure, when, of course, it is, again, it, it is just the power structure. The greengrocer in the Soviet Union, he's just coming out and saying, I'm in support of the power structure. It's as simple as that. So the, the reframing of it has been very, it's very, very difficult and very, to be an actual dissident in the West. But despite it all, reading through Havel, I am quite optimistic. Uh, it does, le and for the following reasons. And it's because you get this cynical attitude to it because it eventually it, it overreaches. And the general public develops two faces. This was a famous thing within the Soviet Union where in public people act and people say things that will not get them into trouble. They'll conform in public, but then in private, amongst them friends, uh, they, they'll all acknowledge that it's all bullshit and they're just waiting for it to come down. And what it does is it gnaws away at it. It makes the... And we saw the way... It, it eventually went that it was quite brittle and it would come down and it would come down hard and the more explicit and in your face and irritating all of this woke stuff gets so yeah if you're if you're uh, at work and you have to go along with the diversity seminar you may have to conform you may as an individual the individual is always so weak You'll ha there's no way around it. You're probably just going to have to sit there and nod and pretend to go along with the bullshit because if you don't, you'll get into trouble. Um, the eye, the eye will come down on you, and you might even lose your job or whatever. What? Who needs the hassle? The same as the bloke uh, in Prague with his the green grocer. Who needs the hassle? Put yourself in the clear. But then, of course, in private, when you're sitting there with your mate in the pub, you're going to say, I don't believe any of this. I think this is all complete bullshit. And you can spread it like that. You can. You, I think it's already well underway in the West because it's just getting too much. I mean, I'm reminded of when I, uh, I used to do the blog and I used to use the analogy quite a lot with something that fascinated me. And that was the... If you look at the, an iceberg... And there, you sometimes you'll see them, and they're just kind of half the iceberg, or like two hundred thousand tons of ice will suddenly just seem to crumble off and fall into the sea, that kind of thing. And it happens because there's a thing called a moulin, where it's fresh water which um, it lands on top of the the ice pack, and then it trickles in because it's a bit warmer, and it trickles in, and what happens is that it it gnaws away at the ice berg the, uh, the the structure of the ice and whereas on the outside of it it looks like really huge and as if it's going to stick around forever actually internally that it's all it's riddled it's been hollowed out and it's actually very weak and then all of a sudden it just collapses like a huge shelf will just drop off 
can fall into the water. And that's pretty much what happened uh, in, in, in the Soviet, in the communist bloc. It was hollowed out because people just didn't believe in it anymore. And the more um, you, we can just talk to people in the real world like this, and there's this feeling where you say, you know what, I really don't believe in this bullshit anymore. Have you seen what's on the BBC now and all of this kind of thing? People get it, even though um, in, the, in, their, in their jobs and all of that kind of thing, they may have to go along with it. But, um, and then eventually you see less enthusiasm for it as well. But what it's, what it's, again, just to get back to the basics here, it's the way that the, this subtle messaging is the weakness of the individual to conform. And you see all this classic liberal bullshit about the individual. In actual fact, um, totalitarian systems... It isn't just that the vanguard, I think this is the key takeaway, it isn't just that it's the crazy social justice warrior vanguard. Uh, your biggest problem is that as individuals, people go along with it because they just want to be left alone. This is, the, this is what it runs on the back. It's far from it being the case, um, as Havel seems to be suggesting here, far from it being the case that the individual can break this all of a, uh, apart or stand up to it. It isn't anything of the kind. It runs along on the backs of millions of individuals who just want to live an easy life and conform. That's what they'll do. That's the general state of man. And Havel uh, even seems to acknowledge this as a cardinal weakness of the human condition because it's through that that totalitarianism is uh, it possible at the end of the day. It's possible because the greengrocer may not be particularly ideological, but he knows what side his bread's buttered on and he just wants to be left alone. But we can work around it by just pointing out the ridiculousness of it all and deflating it that way. So thanks for listening, folks. I'll put the link I'll put the link to the essay below it's very much worth a read catch you later